Hello, everyone. My name is Christian Sandvig, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Berkman Center uh, lunch talk. Um, I'm going to be introducing myself and the group here before we begin. Um, I'm an associate professor at the School of Information and the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Michigan. And I'm here visiting with my uh, esteemed colleagues, um, Carrie Karahelios and Cedric Langbort. Uh, Carrie is an associate professor of computer science at the University of Illinois. And Cedric is uh, associate professor at the Coordinated Science Laboratory, also at the University of Illinois. And both of them are co-directors of the Center for People and Infrastructures um, at uh, Illinois. So, okay, so today's talk um, will be done jointly by the three of us, actually sequentially by the three of us, and our title is Uncovering Algorithms. To get started, I'd like to take you back to uh, the 1960s. Um, Back in the 1960s, there was a computer system that was uh, incredibly significant in the history of computing. Some of you may know it. It's called the Sabre system. Anyone know the Sabre system? Uh, the Sabre system was one of the first large-scale applications of computing um, commercially. So it, at the time after it was built, it was the largest computer network that was non-governmental in the world. And its purpose was airline reservations. Um, so the Sabre system was actually built by uh, American Airlines. And um, uh, the American Airlines had the idea that uh, rather than using this really interesting paper and pencil and Rolodex system they used to use for reserving seats on planes, computers might be able to handle the immense logistical challenge of reserving all the planes in American Airlines fleet. So they distributed terminals, and the terminals were to be used by ticket agents and then later um, travel agents, and they crucially allowed people to reserve flights other than American Airlines. So you might know Sabre because it's now still exists and it's the engine behind sites like Travelocity or Expedia. And so this is the Sabre system. Uh, now American Airlines that paid for the Sabre system um, was at the time led by the somewhat controversial CEO named um, Bob Crandall. And uh, Bob Crandall, uh, this talk isn't about price fixing. This is just the picture of Bob Crandall that I found, although he does look slightly guilty. I imagine that he <laughs> provided this picture to the, to the New York Times, but he looks slightly guilty. And he was a controversial figure um, because users of the Sabre system actually found that uh, it seemed to privilege American airline flights over other airlines' flights. And uh, at first, this was just a suspicion among the competitors to American. But later, it became uh, somewhat obvious that this was happening. And it launched a famous uh, antitrust investigation against American Airlines. Now, uh, Bob Crandall, um, uh, Bob Crandall uh, built the Sabre system. And one of the interesting things about it is when he testified before Congress about what he was doing, um, he gave this quote which introduces our topic today. He said, the preferential display of our flights and the corresponding increase in our market share is the competitive raison d'etre for having created the Sabre system in the first place. And so rather than going in front of Congress and saying, well, it's just an unbiased search system, he said, of course it's rigged. Why wouldn't we rig it? Why would anyone invest so much money in an internet platform and not rig it? So we might call this the Crandall theory of <laughs> algorithmically curated material. And the Crandall theory would be, of course it's rigged. Why wouldn't it be rigged? Why would we spend so much money on it anyway? Of course it's going to advantage our interests, sometimes perhaps over the interests of the people looking for flights. He actually pioneered, HCI fans are interested perhaps, he pioneered this idea of a unit at American that he called screen science. And these people were tasked with manipulating the order of results on the Sabre system so as to increase profits. Um, so let's move forward then from the 1960s uh, to today. Um, you know, at the time, 1960, the 1960s, you know, this was a pioneering computer system, but, but now we live in an online world that's totally awash in algorithmically curated content, from the search results that we get from Google and Bing to social media sites where our news feeds are curated. And uh, we often have some uncertainty about what exactly those algorithms are doing. Um, and so our talk today is to address this sort of rising, I would say, a chorus of scholarship that says that algorithmically curated material is important, and there might be some reason that we need to know how the algorithms work, even if we don't work at the algorithm providers. And these reasons could be legitimate. So in Crandall's case, 
Some have argued uh, that he was breaking the antitrust law. So that would be a legitimate reason to know how the Sabre algorithm worked. But it doesn't have to be illegal. You might just be a user of these algorithms. And in order to make an informed decision about what system you want to use, you want to know what they're doing. Maybe you want to know what they're doing with their personal information. Maybe you're a, a competitor. Uh, and so on. So there might be legitimate reasons for you to want to know inside the algorithm, even though you don't own the algorithm itself. Um, so this picture is actually from a great story in Read, in Read White, uh, it used to be Read Write Web, um, about Facebook's system of likes. As some of you may have read in the background material that's on the link for today, um, the Facebook news feed um, has some interesting features, and one of them is that uh, when people like things on the newsfeed, sometimes those likes are repurposed and attached to advertisements that are shown to their friends. And so uh, one of the interesting things about this story is that the journalist who wrote the story did a great job describing how people started to notice what we might call implausible like relationships. Like, the, oh, my, you know, my friend, the, the, you know, the rabid vegetarian likes McDonald's. My friend, the Marxist, thinks that Facebook is great. This is strange. And, and then so they actually embarked on a process where they uh, did things like some people created fake Facebook accounts and tinkered around to try and see if they could reproduce this behavior. Other people just talked to their friends and said, can anyone send me any pictures of things that Facebook says I like to try and figure out how the algorithm works? And so this is really our topic today, is that you might be using a system that's algorithmically curated, and you might want to know how the algorithm is working. But it's kind of a, a tricky thing to figure that out, because we all have uh, a personalized uh, experience with these, uh, with these algorithms. And when I say a chorus of scholars, I just want to briefly mention that the names, some of them in the audience today, I mean, people have been writing about this, like uh, Gillespie, Nissenbaum, Zitrain, Barocas, Pasquale. I mean, it's really a large number of people who are saying, this is important stuff, and we need to, we need to do something about it. But what is it that we're going to do is, is not always that clear. And so our topic is sort of the next step. So for the remainder of the talk, I'll address these questions with my colleagues. The first question is, how can research on algorithms proceed without access to the algorithm? Is that just impossible? Should we give up? What should we do about it? How might we uh, address this, this problem? It's a very difficult problem. And then, um, for the remainder of the talk, we'll actually present some initial results from our attempt at trying to look into the Facebook newsfeed algorithm a little bit, crudely. Um, and we're going to ask questions like, what is the algorithm doing for a particular person? How can we usefully visualize what it's doing? Not visualize the news feed, but visualize the algorithm, which is a different problem. And how do people make sense of it? Um, so uh, our proposal, in a nutshell, relies heavily on an idea of uh, a, a question, a quick question, a clarification question. OK, an algorithm, um, an, a, a good word to replace the word algorithm is recipe. Um, so an algorithm is a, a series of steps. Yeah, so, so that's, I think, is that my computer science colleague nods? All right, so, um, so, so in other words, how does Google decide what search results to give you when you type in a query? There's a series of steps encoded in software that produce a result for you. I mean, technically, we might have a more formal definition, but, but let's not. Um, okay, so social science audit. So the, our answer to this problem of what to do relies on this methodology called the social science audit. I said social science audit because the word audit might conjure financial audit, and that is similar. But the social science audit is a very famous methodology in the social sciences that was originally pioneered uh, in the housing department in the United States to detect racial discrimination. And the idea of the audit methodology is that you send... Uh, testers, they call them in audit methodology, to see what actually is happening in a particular social situation. So in, in the case of the housing audits, they would send testers to try to do things like buy houses and rent apartments to see if they were discriminated against. And so this is our metaphorical comparison to what we'd like to do with audits. A famous audit study that was in the news recently that you might have heard about uh, is this study published in uh, APS. Uh, where a psychologists and, and people at a business school actually did an audit of professors. Um, I'll jump to the New York Times headline because it's a better headline. They found professors are prejudiced. They, they basically sent professors requests for meeting that were identical, and then they varied the names of the person requesting the meeting, and they varied them according to, for example, the U.S. Census has a, a, a list of the names that are in common use, and it associates them with different 
uh, genders and racial and ethnic groups. And so if you vary the name on the message, you could create an association between a, a gender and a racial and ethnic group. And they found that if you were a woman or if you were a member of a, a racial minority, you were less likely to get a response from your professor when you asked for an appointment. So that's a standard example of the social science audit methodology. So our proposal in this talk is that we should have algorithm audits. And I'll describe what exactly uh, I mean by that. Um, but uh, yeah. So uh, our proposal is the algorithm audit. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to actually give you five example research designs of how you might do an algorithm audit. And these line up with other things that people have proposed. And so what I'm going to do a little bit is introduce them, but I'm also going to say why I think one is a little better than the other. And then we'll move on to the second part of the talk where we'll, we'll say what, what we're going to do. Um, our example is Facebook, but th this actually is a broad topic. So Facebook is not really the overall point, And it could be any platform that has algorithmically curated content. So actually, when uh, I tweeted about this talk earlier today, someone who may be in this room tweeted back. And they say, you should just get them to tell you what the algorithm is. And that would solve the problem. Uh, and in fact, that's been proposed by many authors. Pasquale is the most associated with this idea. The, the thing about that, though, is that it seems like a great idea at first. But then when you think about it a little more, what would you actually do with that information? So for example, let's say that I had in this pocket the Google search results algorithm. Like, what would that look like exactly? Like, first of all, it changes all the time. It's, uh, if it were in code, it would be quite lengthy. It might be, we might agree on what certain parts of the algorithm are doing, but we wouldn't necessarily be able to use the algorithm to predict a particular outcome of a particular instance unless we had data about what kinds of things were fed into it. It's, it's not really clear that reading the algorithms is going to be super useful. There are some instances where it might be useful, where there's some process question we might want to settle. But generally, um, having the algorithm public is not necessarily the answer to our concerns. You can see this, in fact, with uh, platforms like Reddit. There are some platforms that have the algorithm public, like um, people who submitted to the, who won the Netflix prize described their algorithm. Uh, people, uh, Reddit has an open source platform, and so most of the algorithm is public, except for a part called vote fuzzing. Um, the thing about making it public as well is that publicizing the algorithm might help people that we don't want to help, because many platforms have associated groups of ne'er-do-wells, spammers, hackers, people who are trying to game the system, right? And so if, if it were comprehensible, we might not want to re release it publicly because people might then uh, use that for nefarious purposes, all right? The second way we might do it is to ask the users themselves about how the algorithm works. Now, you could think about this. Does anyone remember consumer reports? They're still around, although they're not the cultural force they once were. But consumer reports, you know, they used to send surveys, for example, to car owners, and it would say, did your car break down? When did it break down? And then they would gather these surveys and issue reliability reports for cars. And so we might think of an interesting algorithmic uh, investigation that would be an audit that would find users and ask them questions. And this has some great advantages. One advantage is that, metaphysically speaking, it might be really important to know what the users think the algorithm is doing. That might be more important than actually knowing what the algorithm is doing. Because you could imagine the users modifying their behavior based on what they thought the algorithm is doing. And this could produce a very different overall system depending on the thoughts that they had about the algorithm. So it has some advantages of finding out what they think. But then the disadvantage would be in a platform like Facebook, like the news feed, asking people a bunch of really detailed questions if we wanted to do a large statistical analysis. I mean, how would that work? You have a lot of sort of problem with uh, remembering. Like, you know, seven days ago, did your news feed contain these four words more frequently? It's just not something that you can ask the users. So a third, um, a third approach that some have taken is scrape everything. This is a, an 1875 painting called Floor Scrapers. Um, a third approach is scrape everything. Oh, that G is cut off. Oh, anyway. Um, and uh, this approach, you would have some sort of programmatic interaction with the platform in order to figure out what the algorithm was doing. But then you run into other problems. And one problem is that the platform might not like it. And currently, a lot of our interactions with platforms via APIs are at the platform's discretion. And so there's an adversarial relationship in an audit study. And it's difficult to know how you would manage that um, prog programmatically. Uh, you also have a problem that in the United States, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act makes scraping things against the will of the platform very problematic. And so when we were interested in doing the study we'll present later, we sought legal advice. And the legal advice told us, don't do it because of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, the fourth out of fifth approach would be sock puppets. 
Sock puppet is internet slang for false accounts that are manipulated by someone else. So a nice thing about the sock puppets is it really mirrors the audit methodology classically to, this, to detect discrimination, for example, because the sock puppet could be a user account that the researcher inserts and then does something. So there's some intervention, like let's see if I search for this over and over again, if the personalization builds up and then I get different results. So the sock puppet has this nice way that you can control sort of what's happening and learn more, but again, you have the problem of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and it's not clear that that's super ethical um, because you're inserting a bunch of fake data into the platform, right? And it might be trivial, but still, it, it doesn't, doesn't seem necessarily the wisest course. Uh, and then finally, um, the approach that uh, we're actually advocating and going to talk about next is the collaborative audit. And that would combine some features from many parts of the, the things that we talked about before. The collaborative audit, you could think of a little bit as this site, biddingfortravel.com, which is obscure. Has anyone heard of biddingfortravel.com? So basically, it's a user community where they all got together and decide, we all like to book hotel rooms on Priceline. What if we all exchange information with each other about what kinds of bids we're putting on Priceline? And then we see, by comparing bids and results, if we can come to a collective understanding of how Priceline works. So that's what bidding for travel is. You can really make a good deal on Priceline if you read bidding for travel. Um, but uh, for our purposes, it's got some interesting features because you've got the users working together. It's not clear that it's unethical because they're using the system as they normally would. At the same time, they're interested in figuring out how the algorithm works. They're, they're exchanging information. Now, this is just a forum, but our idea for the collaborative audit would be there would be some software-assisted way that you could organize a large group of users and learn from them. So on that note, I'm going to pass the, the mic to my colleague, Professor Kara Halios, and she'll talk about our study. Um, can you hear me? Uh, I think I'm on. Okay. So we began by sitting in a room together, um, playing with the Facebook API, seeing what we can get. Can we get what posts people see or appear on their news feeds? Can we get what people like, what comments they like? Our goal was to better understand the algorithm ourselves and to create some sort of visualization so that participants um, in a study might be able to better understand the elements of their algorithms presented in the form of the Facebook news feed. So we gathered lots and lots of data. We were trying to figure out what was going on, and we found it was really hard because we made a Facebook group page, and it turns out that if you look at the, how many people see it, four of us saw it, it would say that one of us saw it. So we were discovering discrepancies in the Facebook servers when they synced. How can you collect reliable data? So we spent a lot of time assessing what it is to get reliable Facebook data. Essentially, we wanted to use this data to visualize the consequences of an algorithm. Um, we did some pilot studies. And casually, in these user studies, we found that some graduate students, even the CS department, who routinely used Facebook, were unaware that their feeds were filtered. So we were showing um, random visualizations. And we just assumed that people knew about the algorithm. Um, we were wrong. We had to take a huge step back and remove the complexity, remove all the likes and comments and all of that, and just go back to the bare bones and create a simple series of visualizations to tell a story about the algorithm, to take users on a visual journey that explores and reveals slowly parts of the algorithm to them. So there is some precedent for this. Um, if anyone's familiar with the work of Kevin Lynch, um, he studied invisible processes in support of design. So in the mid-1900s, it was wayfinding studies. He explored how individuals perceive and navigate the urban landscape. And what about, he looked at what about a city allows easier perception, more accurate mental maps for the dweller. And his work actually was incorporated into practice for better urban design. So we borrow from him, and the approach that we came up with was um, an interview survey approach um, similar to what Kevin Lynch did. Um, we then created something that we're calling a prompt that I will explain shortly that exposes some of these hidden algorithms to users using the Facebook API. Um, and finally, the idea is to work with many users together to help them personally and as a collective understand what's happening. And today I'm going to present these first initial steps as a work in progress. So what did we do? We brought 40 people into the lab. Uh, we did a simple pre-interview to understand their Facebook usage. Um, we showed them our, our prompt. And again, I'll explain that in a little bit. And then we did a follow-up interview. Um, with these 40 people, we spoke to them anywhere between an hour and a half and three hours. We found people really wanted to talk about their experience using the newsfeed. Um, the study ran from November of 2013 to April of 2014 with the follow-up in June. Um, unlike most of the computer science studies I've done in the past where we get about 40 CS students or anyone we can find down the hall, 
we went to great efforts to try to recruit a good representative sample, as good as we could, as good as we could get. Um, in this pre-interview process, we collected demographic info, like I said. We discussed Facebook practice. Like, I didn't know that people would just glance at the news feed, then go into people's individual timelines and back and forth. Like, a lot of this was new to me. Um, we got people's general Facebook beliefs. Um, and then after that, um, we showed them our prompt, which I'm going to describe shortly. So um, FeedViz is the prompt that um, takes you on this visual journey. It's a set of four panels that emphasize the content and the people that are reflected in your Facebook news feed. So I'm going to start by showing you uh, the first fan panel. Um, so like I said, it's a Facebook web app that uses FQL and the API to extract posts and other features from your Facebook feed. What you're looking at here on the left is all the posts that were posted by all of the friends on your specific network. In this case, this is my network, actually. On the right are the posts that appear on my news feed. And you can't see this very well in this projector, but the ones that are both are colored the same way. Um, so for example, I did not see that Cliff Lampy liked to post, but I did see that um, James Landay wrote VPN for China working, check. Um, one of the first things that people noticed when they saw this is just how long this left column is compared to the right column. It's huge. It's huge. You're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. You're not getting to the end. And we only showed about a week's worth of data. Um, I can tell you that I don't remember the first time I realized there was an algorithm behind the news feed. I just don't remember. Some people did. For most of our subjects, this view was the first time they're even aware of the existence of an algorithm. More so, um, they had no idea how the algorithm affected their use. Yet, almost everyone was very eager to talk to us, start a conversation about it, and probe parts of the feed exposed by the tool. Um, just to give you a glimpse of our subject pool, it turns out that 37% of the people, roughly, were aware that there was an algorithm before participating in our study. Um, and 62% were not aware. Um, so I showed you the content panel. The next step we took them to was on a people panel. This is a person view. Um, and the idea for this one was to make sense of why people appear on your news feed um, and try to make sense why some folks are hidden. So for example, what you're looking at here, on the left are three bars representing three people whose posts are completely hidden from you. You don't see their posts. On the right are three people whose posts you see all of. And in the middle, you get this hybrid mix of posts that you see and you don't see. So for example, I saw all of Justine Cassell's posts for the week. Uh, Jennifer Chase posted two things. I saw one of them, but I did not see the other. And Jim Foley posted a message that I think I really wanted to see, but I don't know because I didn't see it. Um, and so here, you can refresh on the screen, and you can keep seeing like, different people and where they appear in this sort of histogram of whose posts you see and whose posts you don't see. And one of the things we found as people were exploring this was that people would get really, really upset when family members, loved ones, appeared in the left two spots and not in the right column. Um, as you keep refreshing, these lists get, kept getting longer and longer. So you can see this full list of everyone's posts that you, where you see all of them. And you'll see that everything these people wrote here was completely hidden from you using this interface. So aggregating these lists, we then wanted to see what would people change if they could change it. So the next view they saw was a modification view, where you could move people around. You could put them from the rarely seen category to the mostly seen or the sometimes seen category. And similarly, we then showed people, this is a people view, we then showed them a separate modification content view. So for example, here on the left, you're seeing posts that were on your newsfeed. On the right are posts that were not on your newsfeed. So for example, I did not see that, that Urs wished Lena a happy birthday. I didn't see that Eric wished his dad a happy birthday. I didn't see that Devaris wished somebody else a happy birthday. But I did see these two images. What we did is we asked people then to check on them. Like, if you hadn't seen them, would you have wanted to see that? Um, in this case, if you had seen it, is this something that you would have been happy living without? Um, and so I'm going to move along to talk a little bit about levels of awareness. Because throughout this probe, this prompt that I'm talking about, participants were talking to us. They were discussing their thoughts. They were giving their own interpretations and theories, like creating a model of how the algorithm works on the fly as they were being shown this information. And I'm going to briefly talk about their paths to, aw to awareness. Like I said, some knew before. And some of the comments they gave to us were along these lines. You know, but some people have, I mean, I have 250 friends, but some people have 1,000. And if a computer wants to show you everything, there's no way it could. Um, it crashes your computer. 
Um, plus, like the phone newsfeed is different from the laptop newsfeed. Sometimes I look at something in my phone, but when I go online, there's a ton more. Um, so basically, the comments focus in three different areas. Um, people felt that things were filtered just because of necessity. If you have 2,000 friends, you just can't show everything. Two, um, comparison. Sometimes people look at the timelines and they look at the newsfeed and they can see the discrepancies or they look at one platform of the phone and one platform of you know, the computer and they notice discrepancies there. And the third way that they mostly found out was through blogs or, you know, the girlfriends came up a lot as explaining to boyfriends why something happened. Um, I read this a while, a year or two ago, or that all of these keys of things that you have to do to get into people's newsfeed. Um, of the folks that were unaware, um, these are some of the comments they gave us. I bet it would be on my newsfeed. I probably would catch it at some point during the day. Um, and probably I just don't scroll down enough. People kept thinking that it was because of their own behavior or their own lack of, of investment that they didn't see many of these posts. Um, I don't know for sure because I know there are some friends, I guess. It seems like I don't see anything by them very often. You know, maybe they just stopped posting. Um, but it didn't occur to them that something was happening behind the scenes. Um, exploring this data uh, from over 40 people, we found some awareness factors that led to uh, somebody knowing about the algorithm. Um, we thought that membership duration would affect it. It did not. We thought that you know, the scene content versus the total content, if you only saw a small amount, would affect it. It did not. We thought that if you had a huge network, it would affect it because then you have like all these people and you might not see some of it. It wasn't a predominant factor. What did affect knowledge of the algorithm was usage frequency, how often you used Facebook, activity levels if you were a heavy poster versus a light poster or a listener. If you'd ever created a Facebook page or a group, um, because you get these analytic pages that summarize how many people go to the pages for you. And finally, if you did use top recent stories and switched between the feeds, or if you blocked people or hit posts. Some of the reactions that we got to FeedViz ranged from, um, you know, people describing folk theories, conspiracy theories. One person quit Facebook on the spot. But most people <laughs> learned, you know, over time, over the course of our visual narrative, to understand why, why it was happening, and it made sense to them. So for most people, we got these initial surprise shocks. Like, so do they actually hide these things from me? Like, hey, um, it's kind of intense because you see the movie the, Fa the Matrix. It's kind of waking up in the Matrix in a way, I mean, you have what you think as your reality of like what they choose to show you, or just what the hell, Facebook. Um, again, I want to stress that these were initial reactions, because very quickly after that, people started saying, so there are some algorithms, something, or some rules to choose, why things that appeared to me. It's very interesting. I never knew that Facebook really hides something. So are they doing some kind of mining or machine learning? Um, and again, I mentioned folk theories. People came up with very, very clever and very likely probable um, features behind the algorithm. They discussed likes, comments, looking at the timeline. Like if I look at somebody's timeline, I'll see more messages from them. If I like something they wrote, I'll see more messages from them. If I communicate with them via the inbox, I'll see more from them. We call these interaction via clicking. So they were really good at grasping the clicking interactions. Someone further to stress that I like politics. Um, I read blogs about politics. That's why I get politic information. And they were moving even outside of Facebook, saying that um, you know, I read this blog, hence I'm getting these posts on Facebook. Um, so this idea of, of topics came up a lot. Um, looking at the other content visualizations and feedback from that, um, in the shot where you see posts, where you see content that you don't see, someone actually was like, I wish I had seen this, because I think she needs support for that mention. I need change support. If I see it, then I will say something. But she was pointing to a comment that she had not seen, and she wanted to support this person and wished she had seen it. In the people view, um, somebody said, for now, I cannot really understand how they categorize these people. Actually, this is my brother. And actually, he needs to be here. I want to see him. I need to see everything my brother says. Um, in the screen where people move things around, in this case, move people around, in this case, move content around, we found that people, most people manipulated um, people from these different views. They moved family into the um, mostly seen category. It turns out in the content view, people didn't change very much at all. There were a few select people that changed you know, a lot of things, but for the most part, it turns out that people were quite content with what happened with the content that appeared on their news feed. Um, so we completed this, this prompt. And then um, this past June, we sent some follow-up questions to people um, just to see how um, they behave on Facebook now and if anything had changed. And we found that 29 of the 40 people replied to our follow-up. And we found that after learning about the algorithm, people changed their behavior. 
Specifically, they changed the reading behavior, um, the interaction. People were a bit more stingy with their likes and careful about what they liked. Um, people switched between the top stories and the most recent post features quite a bit more. Um, and they started hiding posts. They started blocking things. Um, they started being a bit more careful about what they posted. And people started unfriending people um, more than they had done in the past. Um, one quote from this was after our discussion, I actually went back and started experimenting a little with the news feed and discussing with some friends on ways to streamline what I was receiving. Since then, I've become more interested in checking my Facebook because it does not seem as cluttered with random information I have no interest in. So people are actually getting more and more involved and in playing with it and probably give it further on their own and using Facebook as a platform for, for a prompt. And I am now going to pass the baton to Cedric. I've been given the hard task to summarize everything and try to tell you where we want to move from this. Uh, what we, what Carrie sh summarized for you showed that actually being a, giving people an insight into not necessarily what's under the hood, but basically allowing people to test drive algorithm actually matters. And that's what that's one of the points we're making for the value of algorithmic audit. It does. It actually had more of an impact than what we thought. It would, in the sense that, as Kerry said, some people just stopped cold turkey or came up with their own theory. But what, what do we want to, and what do we want to go from from here now? One of the things we're working on now is to actually scale feed these, feed these up so that it can be used by more than 40 people and actually be widely available. And then, based on all the data that we want to gather, actually perform the type of audit that Christian was talking about. And in some sense, if if you like, we want to mach machine learn the machine learning algorithm. The issue, of course, being there that as opposed to Facebook or Google or whoever you want, the data isn't centralized. The data is distributed among the users. And so we have to take care of uh, our own algorithmic problems in terms of pre preserving privacy, distributing data, and, and sharing information among the users. But at the end of the day, instead of a whole bunch of individual folk theories, we would want to arrive as a communal, common view of, a dialogue, of what we think the news feed is doing based on all the data that people have gathered. Uh, as a, what, what does matter also, and we've been trying to scratch our head as to whether that's good or bad, is this idea of actually giving, give, giving users insight into why they're getting the data they're getting is something that's gaining wider acceptance. You are probably aware of the fact that there's this feature in Google that whenever you're performing a search, you can click on this little yellow ad thing. It would tell you, you're getting this ad for such and such reason. And very recently, Facebook announced that they're rolling out a similar feature. The, we, we did see, again, through Kerry's study that, so if you devise that, this, may, this ha, can play an important role. The question is, does it matter what the motive is? It's, been discussed that maybe Facebook has ulterior motives. They may want to go back and correct this prediction so that they get more, more data. We think that it might actually matter what the motive is, and, but there, there isn't. Nonetheless, we think there is value in showing people definitely why they're getting the, the, value, the recommendation or the ad that they're getting. And again, that's the idea that was behind FitVis. So to conclude, really, I want to end with a question, an admonishment, and a call to arms. The question, which had been underlying the, this study and really came out of not quite the audit, because we're still on our way towards performing the type of distributed audit that we want, but even putting a prompt into newsfeed in this case, is this question of what do, you, what do users really need to know about algorithm? I think we've hopefully convinced you that there is value in telling you something about this algorithm. Again, we're not, it, it seems that you may not have to be able to necessarily open the hood and look under the hood. Maybe test driving it is good enough, but what kind of test drive do you want to do? And again, that, that you could see that in, in the wide range of reaction that Kerry got. Uh, the, that was a question. The admonishment is that, again, transparency alone is not enough and may not even be feasible. And we, we believe that an audit is, might, might actually be more valuable than, and more feasible than really just opening the hood and letting you peer into the specifics of the algorithm. And to do that, we need to create an infrastructure 
for auditability, not transparency, but auditability. And that's really a wide, that's a wide ranging project. But we'll, there are some obstacles to auditability right now. Again, at the le first of all, at the legal level, as Christian mentioned, it may sometimes even auditing, depending on how you perform the audit, the audit may be illegal or may run against some of the user's agreement of, of the platform you're trying to audit. But that may be a great place not only to extend the law, but also to extend maybe even how we give access to APIs. And also, that may be a great place where nonprofit or even maybe a government agency might actually do, do a lot of good and valuable work. And I'll end with that, and thank you for your attention. So, um, uh, so we didn't arrange in advance how we would do Q&A. Who wants to run Q&A? We're all going to run me. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, um, yeah, well, you don't, you don't have to stand up, it's fine. It's a, um, so uh, we're happy to take your questions, and uh, we need you to speak into the mic because of the, uh, the live stream, which I forgot to mention, actually, during the intro. This is being live streamed, and so anything you say is public. Yeah. My question is not about your conclusions, but about how you did this in the first place. In order to show those screens, it seems like you must have access to some sort of totally unfiltered raw feed that has everything. Um, does that mean anybody can do that? And how did you get that? And if you did it without the cooperation of Facebook, how did you, especially how did Basically, you do it? Every, every single person came into the lab. They signed a consent form. We explained the study to them. They logged into their Facebook account and used our Facebook application. So by using our Facebook application, the API allows for calls where you can get at everything that their friends post. So. This is, a, this is an application that they used. Once they logged out, you know, it, it was gone. So we could only see the data while we were standing next to them, and they were using the application with themselves signed in. Does that mean any of us could write a similar app and, and basically see a raw feed anytime we want? You could see your raw feed if you wrote an app, correct? Oh. Yeah, and actually we, we hope to release our tool, in which case you could use our tool to see your raw That's feed. That's definitely not well known. But that, that's an important point is that Right now, Facebook is coming to you embedded with algorithms and filter, filters that you didn't choose. But that doesn't have to be this way. You can, you can pick your filter. You can make your filter. Yeah, I mean, another great point is they're probably listening. So Facebook, don't turn it off. Like, do we want auditability to be dependent on their, uh, their saying it's OK for us to do this? Because they can change the API uh, tomorrow. Well, if you want to censor that part of the uh, record, Right, that's right. Dan, can you cut that out? No, I'm just kidding. Um, where's the mic? Right here. Okay. I actually have a similar question about the what is actually the all in the all, right? Like, presumably, it doesn't include things that have been caught by Facebook spam filter, whatever that entails. Presumably, it doesn't include things that people have reported or marked as spam that have been pulled out of the all feed. And I guess I'm wondering, I mean, so if top news is known to be a subset of the all, we still don't really know what all is a subset of. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I wonder if you think that your um, collaborative audit approach is able to answer that sort of question, or if that's kind of an entirely different black box that we need to tackle through a different approach. So I can tell you, them, those questions are excellent, and we were struggling with that as well. So the all approach more closely resembles the most recent feed. And so we took, for someone like me, we took about a week's worth of, a week's worth of, of news feed posts. And it's, it's quite long. It's, it's longer than you, you could actually probably sit and scroll through, which is why the studies probably went over three hours and people wanted to sit there longer. Um, but it's more of a timeline approach that you get. So if I wanted to get the top stories feed with the API, today I cannot get that. So we used the most recent. Um, we used the most recent. So I hope that answers part of your question. I know there was a part two, but I forgot the part two. I think it was the the spam and the marked content, and is that? So what's not? What's posted to Facebook that's not in the all? Yeah, I don't. I don't know that yeah. we're going to be able to get that right. I, it's a, it's a great yeah. question. I mean, it would be neat. So I also have a related question on the <laughs> other side, which is, I mean, in some ways. Facebook is more open than most algorithms you see. I mean, even if their API goes away, you could probably painstakingly 
we do this by taking all the names that someone is friends with and then individually going down what every single thing that person posted because it's on their page. To create the all, To yes. create the all. So you could yeah. recreate it without even the API. But most algorithms are not like that. I mean, most of the things that we see that are algorithmically filtered, there's, there is no accessible version of all. At the beginning, you, you said that you saw this as being not specifically about Facebook, but about all kinds of things we deal with, with algorithmic filters from Google to Pandora to whatever. I put in the Pandora because their algorithm mm -hmm. bugs me. But um, how do you see applying your technique or your approach when you don't have any kind of access to something resembling all? So, you know, we chose specific features to look at. So if we were to choose Twitter, you know, we might choose some other features as well, or maybe have a subset of all or more. Um, this idea of all on Twitter is just huge. You know, I don't have, I, I think it costs right now like a million dollars to get a year to get like all of Twitter. Um, and you can get a subset, you can get 1%. Um, but we chose specific features, and I think for different tools or for different social media sites or different news feeds, we could cater specific features of the site to expose. We don't, might not necessarily have to choose this specific one. But there are other features you might expose that might give you an idea that an algorithm is, you know, is lying under the hood. I mean, I think Carrie's point is, is, uh, is partly, um, my reaction is that uh, agreement, I think, but it's like, um, Facebook's all versus filtered is not really a limitation of the collaborative audit approach. It's just what Facebook does because you know Twitter changes the font size on tweets that are looked at a lot, but it doesn't have the filter that works in the same right. way except so for search results. But but you could do the, the same collaborative audit uh, because it just r involves testing and looking at the results and comparing information in its most general form. And so you actually have communities that already exist around many of the algorithms that we use every day that are trying to do this. So your example, Judith, was was Google and. I mean, there you have Google uh, has this big SEO community that tries to you know, think about how the algorithm works by querying it over and over again. And so uh, our proposal is that if you organize this behavior a little more, because it, right now it's often on these forums where people are just like, yeah, I tried that 50 times and I still got this. You know, if it were uh, programmatic and organized, maybe by Mechanical Turk or some other interface or some, something that allows you with data, I think that you could actually learn a lot. It might not be exactly these things, but that wouldn't be because the collaborative audit wouldn't work, it would just be because the algorithm is doing a different thing. So just quickly, what would you call the algorithm on Twitter? Because it seems relatively non-algorithmic. I mean, maybe I'm missing. <laughs> but relative to Facebook, or I mean. Well, I mean, uh, Tarleton's piece about Twitter says that the most relevant one is the trending algorithm. OK, yeah. I guess it seems so ir irrelevant in some ways. They sort of space. Oh, but, but they also, I mean, their search results are, are pretty heavy handed, aren't they? I mean, you, you search results and the, the all versus um, top. Yes. Are, that's a similar thing to the Facebook, right? Thanks. Um, so I, I wonder, I mean, I'm hugely sympathetic to the questions you guys are trying to answer, and I think they're fascinating. I, I wonder if part of what is coming up in the questions that Chris and Judith had. Um, it strikes me that the metaphor of the audit is a little tricky because in some ways using the API, it's, it's as much sort of critical technical practice, right? Where it's, you, you have access to bit of information, many of your users don't know how to do that, right? They're not writing API uh, interfaces themselves, but you can do that and create a different access to the information and then do this kind of like contrast, right? Sort of recognize that, which feels a little different than the idea, like the classic one, where you just send in moles. It's more of a sock puppet approach, right? You send in someone and go do the thing they're supposed to be able to do and get information back sort of on the ground. So part of it, I think, is this question of just you know being able to say, like, sometimes this can depend on the API. Sometimes there won't be an API, or an API won't give you the kind of information you have, so you have to play it differently. But I was wondering if, if the suggestion you were making about taking feed viz and expanding it past you know, the 40 students you bring into the, into the room, but being able to make it available on a wide scale. Was there also an idea that if you did that and then the, the people who were playing with it were then telling you information by their choices, right? So like, boy, I don't care about the people. I don't care about moving the mostly seen off. What I do care about is moving the never seen on or vice versa, right? You might start to begin to have data on that. Is that part of the impulse so that then the truly collaborative audit is you set this thing into the wild and then many, many people begin to not only learn that there's an algorithm and learn something about how it works, but then say, here are the impulses I would have about fixing the algorithm. Um, and I wondered also about 
Uh, well, I'll leave it at that. So that's part of it. So we do have the data for the 40 people, and we're actually analyzing it in more depth. This is a work in progress. I mean, there are some interesting um, tools out there that also help expose people more in the wild. There's this wonderful game by Watchdog where it takes your Facebook feed, and it actually the characters around are inspired by characteristics. So if there's somebody that you don't speak to very often, you know, they might be, um, it might claim that you're suspicious of them. And so the features on Facebook actually affect the behavior in the game itself. And that's another way to think of getting at awareness. Um, but one of the things that we learned doing the study is that you don't know what to expect. So while we do want to get it out into the wild, I think it's going to take a few trials and a few pilots to see what people want to do. Um, you know, we've done an, an other similar types of audits on Mechanical Turk, and we found that people just don't want to fill it out. And so it's a trial and error piece. And then how do you deal with the fact that the algorithm changes over time? This research process takes time. How do you handle mm -hmm. that? Excellent question. I mean, I think, you know, generally speaking, um, I'm, I just want to say I, I'm pretty delighted by these results. I, I think that they're actually really interesting and they're really give me a lot of hope because the transparency stuff that was written about algorithms, I just didn't see how it was going to work. Uh, and so it didn't leave me feeling like there was anything that we could do. And yet we have like really important societal problems. I mean, maybe Bob Crandall wasn't enough. I mean, I should have mentioned like, Latanya uh, Sweeney's work about uh, racism in ad placement or something like that, right? I mean, so we have these really important problems that we would like to address, and we don't really know how. And, and so I, I'm actually quite encouraged, and I like the audit app metaphor a lot, even though I admit, as you pointed out, it's not exactly the same as the classic audit. But I like it in part because we could ask, who does audits now? So housing audits are still performed, and they're actually done by activists, oft, sometimes in collaboration with researchers who help with the statistics. They're done in lawsuits. And so in some ways, this is like a blueprint of what civil society might do to address this algorithmic structure that people are increasingly concerned about. So you're right, totally a fair cop. It's not a perfect parallel. But I actually like the idea of testing over and over again, whether it's a sock puppet or a real person. And I also like the idea of collaborating with the people partly because that gets around some of the legal problems, but also because just generally that seems like what we ought to be doing is working with people to help them understand what's happening. So I, just, I, just, I don't think I was positive enough. And again, to some extent, if we wanted to go back to really what, to the essence of the algorithm, if we were interested in really learning the algorithm, that would be an issue that things keep changing, obviously. But that, that's not even the standard that we're going after. In some sense, you, if a large, enough, a large enough community of people get through multiple testing experiences, the impression, it's confirmed, it's not just your own peculiar experience with, with this algorithm, that something is happening. That may be ground enough to say that maybe that's not the intended effect that you wanted, but that may be ground enough to go back and say, well, th this is what your algorithm seems like to a reasonable amount. And that seems to agree somewhat to the standard of, of law that is ruling existing audits. So again, the point is not that we're not, we've been having very long discussion, including late in the night yesterday, about are we reverse engineering or not? We're, we're, we're not reverse engineering in the sense that the goal, we're, we're not going after a sheet of paper that says, this is what your algorithm is. But if somehow that might not being a lawyer, but my feeling is that this is really how law works. Is there are of course rules, but if a large and or that's at least how IRB works, is if a large enough community of people have a, a common experience that this is how the the artifact they're interacting with works, maybe it's true. At least as far as law and IRB is concerned. I would I would also be curious to see like people doing something similar you know, over, over periods of time. So even just talking to them before and after, it was nice seeing the change. And you can imagine that over periods of time, maybe like larger changes will, you know, have more collective shifts. So I would be curious from a qualitative point of view, even to talk to people once every two years or so. I'm surprised that you didn't mention advertising. And um, I, I think it's very reasonable to imagine that the actual algorithm, the hidden algorithm, has inputs from people who are buying your attention by the, the feed. And right now, a lot of that is um, overt. You know, an ad announces itself as an ad, uh, incredibly annoyingly. Um, but more insidiously, 
um, of course, if someone mentions something that is either the name of a product uh, for which someone has bought essentially advertising space, um, it could be bumped up in the algorithm, uh, or even more insidious things. And um, anyway, you mentioned motivation, and I'm relieved to see that uh, Zuckerberg spoke with uh, the Wall Street Journal and said that it has nothing to do with making money. That the, <laughs> the reason that uh, the newsfeed was opened up to uh, advertising is uh, to create the illusion of uh, profitability so he could retain the best engineers. I'm looking at an article here. So don't worry about the, the advertising side. I was curious, uh, though, here's my actual question. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, hot air right now around consent uh, with research and Facebook. Um, are you guys worried? Are you taking, are you considering your kind of project differently in light of all this kind of uh, misplaced, I feel, uh, concern about consent and research? I can take the first part. The advertising oh, part. So in the pre-reading, the, the third link is all about advertising. And we mentioned it a few times, so I guess I'm just going to say, bravo, we agree. So, so the, what, the corrupt personalization thing is all about advertising. And the example here about liking and the likes being attached to ads are about advertising. So I definitely think that's a, oh, and Cedric's thing about clicking on the eye to see why the ad was recommended. So I think we're, we're totally with you on seeing this as being really relevant to advertising and the profit motive. And, what Bob Crandall wants and what Mark wants. So then you want to answer the, you can have the consent one. Oh, consent, I mean, if you notice, I mean, we were, we were probably more careful than we needed to be. We brought people into a lab. It's very consenty. Um, you know, and, you know, they sat down, they filled out a consent form, you know, they, they opted to put in, just to log into Facebook to do the study. So this is about, this is the more consenty side of things. Moving to more, collectivism side of things, you know, Christian gave a great discussion and Cedric about, you know, looking at, there's two different things here. There's law and there's like ethics. So like I, I see consent as falling into the ethics part of things. And so far, you know, we've done, you know, we've been as consenty as we could be. Um, moving towards a more collectivist approach, there's interesting ways to do consent and you can do online consent. And so, you know, that's very commonplace. Um, um, it's more like you get a splash page. If you like some, if you agree to go further, you click on it. You know, you give your consent and you well, you know proceed with the study. You know, just a, a minor point there. I think the co idea of a collaborative audit though would be collaborative. Like there was a really interesting This American Life story about someone who performs housing audits as their job for a nonprofit, and uh, they found this to be a transformative experience because they were shocked at the extent of racism. And uh, from my reading of the Facebook environment people would like to collaborate with us to help us figure out their news feed. So in some sense, we don't really have the same consent mm -hmm. problem, I think, and that results with our, that's, we're also saying that's really a key thing. Like, learning about the algorithm from three university professors is different from learning about the algorithm from Facebook telling you this is what it does. Hopefully we have more credibility. <laughs> we're not psychologists. So. No, but there's interesting approaches of things you can do like collaboratively as well and, and still have consent. People want to, People do want to, people really want to talk. Like these were some of the funnest discussions we've had. I'm Nathan Matias, a PhD student at the Media Lab and a Berkman Fellow. And uh, over the last eight months or so at MIT, we've been reacting to uh, legal challenges and um, things like subpoenas served to students for research they're doing on things like Bitcoin. And we're starting to talk to groups like the EFF to figure out how we can uh, support researchers who are doing work that's in gray areas of law, like audits, which could fall afoul of CFAA, and figure out uh, where there might also be policy changes that could be needed. I'm curious to hear how far down the road you've gone, and I'd love to chat afterward as well, um, but I think I'd love to hear here about like how far down the legal road and policy road you've been thinking in this space. Well, uh, the you know the thing about presenting about problems with the CFAA in legal venues is that there's not a lot of debate because you say, "Wow, the CFAA really sucks," and then all the lawyers are like, "Yeah, it really sucks." Um, so uh, the issue there might be uh, political will, um, but. Certainly, this is something that we've talked about in other venues, and I think it's great that you raise it here. Like, there must be some lawyers around here somewhere, right? 
here we are. And, and these are, and we're, we're researchers, hopefully on the side of the just, and we're struggling, and partly we're struggling because of a sort of legal institutions that seem to be in our, in our way here, even though I think what we're trying to do is the right thing. Um, similarly, um, audits are really tricky with IRBs, relating to the previous question, because you are in an adversarial relationship with your subjects, and the IRB doesn't really envision that because it evolved from medical research, and so they don't really imagine the physician being in an adversarial relationship with their patient. But um, so that there's an interesting discussion to be had there that probably needs looking into. Although um, I think we've been lucky with a reasonable IRB, so we say this is what we're doing, and it's okay. But but this is a, an, an area that I think we we need help with. I mean, the research community should stand up and say yes, this is what we need to do. Person whose name I've forgotten. Your your point is what we should do. We should uh, reform these laws. I have a question about. Um how you, did you get the scene data? Uh, did you have to write your own JavaScript, or does Facebook API give you the scene uh, content? Um, we go through a list of all of your friends and then look at their timelines. Oh no, that's that's for the all. For the yeah, scene, the there's all, a, the, in, scene. the API. The API provides that. And so we don't do you know if Facebook, you actually saw it. We know if it was on your news feed. If there's it a was displayed by the computer. Yeah. So do you and there's think a difference between, I'm sorry, how far you scroll down, too, because if you get to the bottom, then um, you know, it repopulates the screen, and so it does that dynamically. It doesn't do it all on the fly. So this is more of a speculative question, then. But So Facebook has that data. Why don't, why don't they share that? Or when I post something, why doesn't Facebook tell me who saw it or who? That's a, that's a good question. There's a, there's a wonderful paper by Michael Bernstein with, he did from within base, Facebook about looking at sort of like the imagined audience. Um, and so they found that the audience was actually, I think, three times bigger than what you thought it was when you, when you posted something. Um, but seeing, we were struggling with the terminology ourselves because technically it's not seeing. It's more like appearing. And whether or not you saw Displayed, it was... Displayed, shown. One, one of the um, points uh, made in that... Um, blog post linked to the talk announcement is that um, they do show the scene analytic. If you manage a Facebook page uh, or a Facebook group, it is possible to get that scene analytic to show up. And it's interesting because one motive that's been advanced, not by me, but by commentators, is that they do that because they want to emphasize that that number could be bigger if you bought ads. So that's why they reveal the scene analytic there is that they say, oh, look how low it is. What, what if you ran a Facebook campaign? Then you would get your well, thing. I've seen that very explicitly if you, if you were on a page. I've seen that, uh, that notice. So. Yeah. Please. This is kind of a silly question, but is it possible that there's actually no one person in Facebook who knows exactly how the algorithm works. <laughs> I just say it because I've encountered situations where I've been on the user end trying to find out how uh, an algorithm works in a piece of software that we bought, and I could never find anyone who could tell, tell me how it was working, just because the organi organization was large or the, the, the key piece of code was buried very deep in the platform. Entirely possible. Wow. I, wish, I wish I could answer that. I mean, it's possible, but I don't know if one person knows exactly how it works. I do know that when you build large, complex pieces of software with many, many people, and if you have a really good chief architect, then that person should know. <laughs> but I don't know for, I honestly don't know. Well, in the, in the pers Well, I, so, I mean, I, I'm skeptical that they know. I don't know what Kerry thinks about it, but I, I'm skeptical. I mean, but one thing that's important to point out is that in a collaborative audit, we're not necessarily interested in assigning blame because we're interested in the consequences right now, and so we detect those consequences. So it doesn't matter that much to us if there is something bad going on, like there's a particular person. And I think that's important because some of our discussions about Facebook have devolved into a discussion of, like, whether Mark Zuckerberg is a nice man to quote mm -hmm. Dan Schiller, but that's really not the point. Like it's a, you know, Google Plus has implemented many of the same algorithms uh, as Facebook, and so uh, it, it's a structure that we need to address. Really, not the whims of personalities of particular people. Um, although maybe there's an there's an evil person who knows it all and is, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it seems like your study, in large part, taught people to 
Uh, maybe be more aware of an algorithmic gaze with both interesting and complicated consequences. Um, and I was wondering if sort of in the process, you guys got lots of what seemed like really exciting qualitative data. Um, if people reflected at all on the fact that it was their choices about relationships and communications that led to the results that they were seeing, that the algorithm was in fact interacting with their own personal choices, and whether or not you saw any self-reflection about how they might manage their relationships separate from Facebook. I mean, the idea of, oh, my brother isn't appearing in this. Maybe your brother isn't appearing because you're never listening to what your brother is saying. So maybe you yeah. should listen to what your brother is saying if you think it actually matters. Like, or it turns out what people were saying about that specific comment was that, you know, I speak to my brother so much face to face, I don't need to speak to him on Facebook. So there is no relationship on Facebook because of the face to face relationship. So there were a lot, I, I couldn't go into it in that much depth because the, in terms of the qualitative data and the analysis that we did on the theories that people came up with, um, they were immense. They fell into the main categories of clicking behaviors, like things that I actively do to articulate publicly that something is happening, to sending inbox behaviors, and then going a bit further into imagining even some algorithms that, that I don't know how to build yet. Um, but they were talking a lot about topic analysis. They were talking a lot about reading pages you know, um, you know, outside, like on Hacker News. And because of something I did on Hacker News, I'm getting this on Facebook right now. So the stories that people were coming up with were pretty complex and pretty, um, they, were, they were very interesting. And I think that, at least in the early phases, a lot of what they, they suggested, I think, is very plausible. Like, I don't know the algorithm, but I can suspect that what I like has something to do with well, actually, from a Facebook paper written by the wonderful Maura Burke, I do know that comments matter more than likes. And so people picked up on that. I guess I meant less about manipulating or gaming the system and mm -hmm. more about maybe these are not choices that are making. No, I think that's a really interesting point. But uh, um, I mean, one thing to emphasize is that we could read the news feed as a sort of accurate lens of our personal relationships in some way. But at the same time, many of the features of the news feed are arbitrarily defined by Facebook, and they're not analogous to any other system, and they're evolving, like the like, like what is a like exactly, and what does it mean? And so I think I would rather emphasize, rather than this being like a, a result of my own choices, that the fact that these are fairly arbitrary systems that we're teaching people to use. And so like personally, I never like anything. I just am very careful about my friend selection, so I usually mm -hmm. want to see everyone if they're posting, but the way if Facebook's own descriptions of its algorithm is correct, that would really result in a sucky news feed for me because I don't interact with the like button or the comments enough, and that's what happens. So am I like wrong for not pressing the like button more and, and using the, the friend feature? So, But your broader point is algorithmic literacy, which is a, a phrase that's gotten a lot of currency lately, and it's an interesting one, and I'm not sure what I think about it. I don't know. We talked about this some. I'm not sure if I'm representing my co-authors, but I mean, in some way, algorithmic literacy seems like a failure because it's like we collectively have built a bunch of systems that we don't like. So the best we can do is sort of teach our children to be skeptical of them, right? So it, it would be nicer if the algorithm sort of worked and were really everyone really liked them. And then, but, but at the same time, when we do so, for example, uh, if we taught people how to use the Facebook. Uh, how to use the Facebook and the Facebook algorithm, that might help them. But in some ways, as, as Carrie's pointed out in other contexts, they don't need that knowledge. I mean, it's, it's most useful when Facebook is doing something they don't like. So if Facebook does something that they like all the time, we might not need to know as much about how the algorithm works. And this is the Zitrain proposal for a fiduciary relationship between you and the, the platform. So that if, you, if the platform's acting in your interest, that's great. You don't need to know as much how, how it works because you hire a lawyer. You don't need to know the law. They know the law. They're working on your behalf. But right now, they're not working on your behalf, and you're not sure what they're doing. So that, anyway, there's a lot to your question that I'm sorry. There's just a really quick thing that this is why we use Facebook. It used to be you could click on someone's name and say, I want to see all their posts. And it's great for people like your brother who might miss. And you don't comment on Or you, you want to see nothing. You want to see those So uh, I don't think you, you don't have a mic. So it, you just said that there used to be a way that you could request to see everyone's post from a particular person. I think they did take that out. Uh, now you can only hide them. Yeah. You can't. That's what close friends was, that you see everything from those people. Everything well, We need a collaborative audit yeah. <laughs> to figure out this. Behavior. Who has the mic now? Dan is pointing. Yeah. Hi, thanks. This is really interesting. I'm Nick Siever, UC Irvine Anthropology. Uh, hey, we cite you, Nick. 
And so I have a question about folk theories, uh, which are of interest to me disciplinarily, I guess. But the, the sort of takeaway being that most of these theories are folk theories. And if you sit alongside someone who's working on a, a personalization algorithm, say, and ask them to explain things that are happening, you get a lot of similarly well, I wouldn't say uninformed, but like informed in a way that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what's going on under the hood explanations, mm -hmm. right? They'll say, oh, well, this must be because whatever. And this has a lot to do with this Facebook question of like, yeah. does anybody know what's really going on? Probably not, it's distributed. But also, be not just because the algorithms are complicated, but because they only do things in conjunction with data. And the thing that these people spend all day bashing their heads against is the fact that unexpected data types come in, screw with what the algorithm does, and it's all edge cases, right? And so one of the things that I liked about the paper about the auditing was this question of, you know, talking about sort of sampling the algorithm, because what you're doing is you're also sampling the space of data that can go into the algorithm. Right. Um, but I'm wondering where this goes. I like the, you know, okay, now people are aware of the algorithm and we're moving from ignorance to awareness or something like that. Um, but I'm not sure what happens in the future when you move from folk theory to something else, especially if, the, if this idea of what the algorithm's really up to is kind of fuzzy in a way that I would suggest is uh, one of the, we were just saying on Twitter, one of the only certain things about algorithms is that they're actually fairly uncertain about what they're doing because they're changing all the time, et cetera. Um, so I'm just curious like, what you're going to do about the fact that you might say that all theories are folk theories at the end, and so why pick one over another? So I think that's a, that's a really nice point. Just to, to go back a little bit, you know, we came across that same problem in developing our study because we, we used to use the term mental maps a lot. We wanted to see what people's mental map was of the algorithm. Um, and it turns out if you don't know one exists, you don't really have a mental map of one in the first place. Um, and you don't create a mental map by using our tool once. You know, you need to experience something quite a bit to develop, you know, a, a model in your head for, for what that actually means. Um, and so in some ways, you know, one path forward is to, you know, collect some of these, collect some of these folk theories and see, you know, what the common denominators are. You know, another path is to actually put out a few, like, tasks for people and say, look, if you do this, you know, can you tell us what the consequences might be and collect a bit more solid data if they volunteer to give it. Um, the idea is not to, like, I think starting with the folk theories has been so much fun because it's been, it's amazing how quickly people know the insides of their networks in ways that as outsiders we could never fully comprehend. Um, and they know sort of like the, 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 the small little things that they did on Facebook like, like two days ago that might have influenced something that we couldn't even have picked out in an interview. But one of the things that we're exploring right now is looking at specific tasks like if I do this, then what might happen? Or Christian had a really nice, um, had a really nice story where one of a post that he made stayed at the top for a really long period of time, and he was asking people, you know, how long it was there, um, why it was there. I don't remember the exact details of your big story, but yeah, I mean, so um, I, I think I completely agree with Carrie's response. Just to get to your first question, or maybe it was your last about what if, what do you do? Are you just going to gather what people think about these algorithms, and it's all going to be sort of a folk theory? But but remember that one port point of feedviz is that it is actually gathering information about the feed and what is shown to you and what isn't. And so that part isn't a folk theory, really. It, it, we're asking people to explain it, but that is actual data about what the, we think the algorithm is doing. And um, keep in mind as well, Crandall's theorem. Like Crandall's view of algorithms is that they're all rigged. And I mean, not to be sensational, but I mean, you know, he was testifying before Congress because he was in trouble. Uh, and um, similarly, like the Latanya Sweeney example I mentioned, like there are laws against things that algorithms might be doing, and the consequences are real, and, and that's really important. And so you could imagine not just an assemblage of interesting things people said about algorithms, but you could imagine the discovery of really troubling things going on with algorithms. And I mean, one example of this would be Edelman's work here at Harvard, where um, just by making individual queries in a variety of platforms himself, not in a collaborative audit, but just like an individual audit, he's found all kinds of stuff going on that, you know, seem like, I think he puts it as, you know, raises concerns about fraud. Like, I mean, his most um, pithy example is probably the way that he added commas to certain search queries on Google and revealed what he believed were hard-coded rules that would only respond to certain keywords, even though Google has said it doesn't use hard-coded rules. But he seemed to think that if you put a comma after some search words that related to health, 
Google Health would then become the first first result, and then if you eliminated the comma, it would not be the first search result. And that's very interesting because um, I'm not an antitrust lawyer, but I think they would be interested, um, <coughs> potentially. Well, maybe not in the US. In Europe, <laughs> they care about that. So actually building on this question of uh, sampling, I have uh, two questions, same question from the computer science point and the law point. So the data here is extremely highly dimensional and the idea that you can sample even a non-zero fraction of that is, is sort of ridiculous. Like it's impossible because there's only seven billion people and there are easily you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of possible inputs. Um, so computer science, from the computer science standpoint, have you thought about how to deal with the dimensionality and exploring the space from the sampling standpoint and I guess from the legal perspective is, does that matter to you if an algorithm could be doing something? Like so for example, I think of discrimination in advertising. Um, so does the fact that it could be doing something legal or is currently doing something illegal or not ethically desirable, uh, does that make a difference? So let, let, let me take the, the second one, the second one first, which I, I think, again, is that's where I see a difference between to be technical model identification and what is what is what might be required for law purposes that provided and I'll go to the first question after that provided I could come up with a model and I could say that you know there, there is a model that's learnable that seems to, the best explanation based on the sampling I have is that you discriminate I don't have a proof but I, all that may all that what that may buy me in a court of law or towards a court of law is maybe the, the option to subpoena. Maybe I can actually, if, if that's what seems to happen, I'm not, I, I will never be able, that, that's the difficulty is I don't think we'll ever be able to assign intent. I will never be able to come out of an audit and say, I do know for sure that you know, you're using race as a discriminating factor. All I can say is, here are very simple models, or here are the most, the most probable models based on the, you know, the traces or the data, the data that we have that, are, that explain the data. And it seems that you are actually discriminating. And maybe that might actually be of interest even to the, to the programmer, because you, you may not even know. For example, in, I'm French. In France, it is illegal to, to have any data that is based on religion. You cannot ask about religion, right? You, you, and to some extent, you can always take surrogates for it. But if by doing so, you were to construct an object that could predict, that could predict religion, you might be in trouble. You may not want to do it. So the, again, no, I, 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 I do not believe, I do not expect to ever be able to assign intent or to even to come up with a, a model that's like, that is the true model with high probability. But it might just be enough. And again, that's also what audits do, is we, you never, at the legal level, you never end up with, you know, you cannot say that discrimination is at play for sure. All you can say is, it very much looks like you're acting as if you're discriminating. Stop. Do something about it. If add noise, so be it. So the standard is different also. That's, that's why, in, in some sense, we think that the concept of audit is actually powerful here. In terms of sampling, you have a good point that definitely there are, that's something that we started looking into. I, again, there, might, there are intrinsic limits to what's learnable from what we could do. And maybe we won't be able, that's one of the things we hope to be able to learn as we scale feed, feed these up, is maybe simply, you know, there, you can go up the level of fundamental, right, fundamental uh, theorems as to exactly, you know, what's the sample complexity of, learning particular thing. So we're, we're hoping to be able to, we're, we're hoping that we can still learn something, but that would be a great experiment in practice. Is it, can we, are we gonna hit those bounds or not? But absolutely, I, I also do not ex expect to be able to learn everything perfectly. And again, neither do I need, do, do I even wanna do this? I mean, just. But that's a great question, absolutely. A closing point on that is that, you know, the quantitative models we use now for things like this really suck. So like, to stay on the antitrust theme, let's look at the HHCI. Is it a really great model of anything? Wait, what does it stand for? Something Hirschenfeld? Someone know? No one knows the All right, so All right, that's whether, a, whether you are, right, is there, is there, right. That's the test to decide whether you are, uh, 
you are... Um, you deserve antitrust you scrutiny. Deserve, it's you a quantitative test to determine whether you deserve antitrust scrutiny, and it's very, very simplistic, and in fact, some, somewhat ridiculous, and yet it's in wide use. And so we don't actually have to do that much in order to do as well or better as some of the things that we're using now. So I think we can improve on current practice. I think Dan is giving us a signal here. Yeah. Is, this the, is that the signal you're giving? Is it this yeah, signal? We can, one more we can manage one more question. <coughs> well, where, who has the mic is probably the person who gets to ask the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I take a sort of perverse delight in database vandalism. And Facebook is the one I like to mess with the most. And one of the things that I like to do to it is I make these custom lists without using any of the free ones that they have. They all have funny names, even I forget their name. And there's one of them that's the only thing I read. How, to what extent am I thwarting its algorithms by never viewing my run, my quote raw Facebook filter in Facebook? You know, that's a really good question. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you create these and who's on these? Because that'll oh, give us. people I actually want to see. OK. Um, I, I, I hate Facebook so much that I want it twice. Um, OK. And the account that I actually use, which is not the easy one to find, um, has a much smaller number of people. But then even on that, I have a smaller list that's like people I know that are actually part of my life that don't post annoying things on Facebook, because I have good friends who do that. And it's just, yeah. It's very, you know, sort of, if I you know, decide I like somebody's stuff when I go look at the alpha of men. Yeah. I'm hanging out with them more with the men. And so that's the only thing I ever look at on Facebook. So I guess I'm, so where is the thwarting? So you're seeing this list. Yeah, and I feel like by refusing to use their preset best friends. I see, I see. So you're not using the smart lists. You're yeah, making your own list. I'm making my own list. Okay. And, you know, you can't tell it anymore to always show me this person, never, you know, you can mm -hmm. just do never. Yeah. But I kind of, I feel like I'm getting around that a little bit by only letting it choose from a much smaller group of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they know who you see. I can tell you that the smart lists are more like a recommender-like system. So the idea is that, um, you know, from the beginning, they're just not very good at all. How many people here use smart lists? Exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> he, said, he said, what are smart lists? I might be using them without knowing they're called that. Uh, so they basically pre-populate <laughs> some groups with close friends, acquaintances. Um, and so uh, Zuckerberg actually gave a talk. I think that less than 5% of people actually use these. Um, so they're not that widely used. Um, if you have a, in a sense, you're creating your own news feed. So you've made your own personalized news feed. So they see what you see in that feed, and they probably make predictions within that feed. But right now, like the close friends and the acquaintance list, from my interpretation, I don't think that there's that much that you can, that much meaningful data you can get from that yet. But it's an interesting point. I mean, we are admirers of this stream of literature that you may know, which is about sort of the tactical use of a system in opposite ways to what it's intended for mm -hmm. some political purpose. And a good scholarly example is, what is it, Track Me Not? Yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, yeah like Helen Nissenbaum, yeah. and I forget her co-author right now, but. Uh, it's a great, so it, it sends false data about you in order to protect your privacy. So there's a, there, it's a really interesting area. That Although there, there's an interesting critique of it by Bushnire from a, an actual security viewpoint of it. But. Yeah, like some other thwarting might be if you put names of people in there also that you don't care to read and somehow find a way to read what you really want out of that mess. But that gets, I don't know how you would do that. See, I didn't even realize that the quote smart list auto-populate because I've never used yeah. Yeah, and so it turns out people don't want to do that. People, it takes time. Dan's giving me eyes. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you very much for a, a very engaged audience. Yeah.